Alrighty, you're looking at a number 206R Reed Manufacturing Company Vice. Uh, these are the big boys. I've seen some 8 inchers online and I've heard tell of 9 inchers as well. Uh, this guy weighs in at about 153 pounds according to the records. I haven't put it on a scale, but I've seen people put them on scales. I'm not really a video maker, uh, but I wanted to take an opportunity to add this out there to the collective knowledge because I'm impressed with all the stuff I've learned from the rest of you YouTubers who do do a lot of work with vices and all the stuff I've read online. So I wanted to just take a minute to talk about two or three things. Um, number one, talk a little bit about the history of this particular vice. Uh, we think it was probably manufactured back about 48, 49. It looks like about that time frame. They made a change. Part of that R revised would be the spud on the front of this. The screw that goes on through there uh, it had a pommel shaped um, front nut on it before or, or front spud. And uh, this one does not have that. There was also a shift somewhere along the line. They went to a split nut. And I'll talk to you about that a little later on as I'm taking it out. Again, lots of people out there making videos with a lot of detail about how they did it. And I won't waste your time on all that, but I'll show you what it looked like. Some of the steps we went through. And hopefully, those of you that have your own vice will have a chance to clean it up or save another vice out there. Um, like I said, this one was my grandpa's. He worked for Harry Darby Manufacturing during the war. And when I was a little kid, he told me about how they were manufacturing tanks so fast that they'd sometimes get behind in shipping and have to stack them on each other. In my head, I imagined as a little kid, army tanks with guns on the front, etc. As an adult, somebody said to me, well, don't you think they probably meant like fuel tanks or something along those lines? And I realized, yeah, that's probably it. But when I inherited the vice, I took a little look into Harry Darby and uh, they here in Kansas City manufactured the landing craft, they called them landing tanks, that you see on the D-Day beach movies where men are dropping the gate on the front of it, running out, jeeps and tanks are coming off of them. And apparently a vast percentage of those tanks, as they were known, landing tanks, were manufactured here, thrown on the old Missouri, the mighty Mo, the muddy, run on down to the Mississippi, and from there to New Orleans, and then picked up and distributed wherever they were needed around the globe. So, again, this 206 weighing in at about 153 pounds. It's got a six inch uh, set of jaws on it, and these are fused right to it. They're not a removable jaw, they're welded in there. Uh, we cleaned it up, this is what you got. I'll show you a little bit of video. Like I said, it's just handheld because I wasn't planning on making a video really for anybody at the time I was doing it. I just wanted it for me. But if you can get some good out of it, that'd be great. It has a couple of things about it that are a little different from other videos I've seen online. And uh, folks really wanted to know what the original colors are on these. And one of the online groups I was reading said, you know, a lot of folks paint them college colors. So K-State's purple and silver or purple and white, and that's what we did this one in. Uh, the Reed Manufacturing Company lost a lot of their records, so I read. Oh, there's a double play on words. But they might have been red to start with. Many of them might have been black. I think this one started its life red, or at least shortly after it first hit the streets, it got painted red. I don't know, and I don't know if this one came from uh, the Darby Manufacturing. It, it was certainly something he picked up secondhand here in Kansas City. I can't imagine he purchased it, purchased it firsthand. Uh, in the records I was looking through, these guys in today's dollars were running about 1100 bucks. And that's 2020, which is a tough year. Uh, so I, I cannot imagine my grandpa picked it up brand new, not raising a family of five boys and trying to manage a farm and working away in Kansas City. He was living away and coming home on the weekends and doing what he had to do to make a go of it in some tough times. All right, so I'll call that good there. We'll show you the rest of the stuff, and if it helps you out, great. Those of you who know even more about this than I do or have something to disagree with, put it down in the comments below. Let's add to the knowledge on these guys. Uh, I hate to let something like this slip away. And it's amazing how something everybody took for granted at one point in time becomes knowledge that's lost. So if you know something more about these old reeds, add it to the bottom. Thanks a lot. So this is a reed 206. Belonged to my grandfather. Uh, it's in good working order. It could use a fresh coat of paint and a little bit of lube. The two in the 206 stands for the swivel base. I suspect there's some rust down in here, a little more than just that surface rust. Uh, 
And then of course the six stands for the jaw dimensions. And so these are six inch jaws. He brought it home in 1954, according to my dad, and it sat in his two shops over the course of the rest of his life. The reeds have enormous steel balls on the ends, and I've read that they're much larger than most of the other vices made at the time. The ram runs in and out really pretty smoothly. You can see I've been lubing it up a little bit. It sat for oof, about 15 years in my uncle's garage, and so it hadn't been used, hadn't been lubed in that length of time, and uh, a little bit of rust had started to form. The very end doesn't want to come out just yet. And I don't know if I don't have the screw quite all the way out. So we're going to go ahead and remove that screw. There's a set nut, or a set screw rather. It has a little point on the tip of it. It has that slot in the end of it. You can see right there. Let me get, that, let me get a little better light on it. It has that slot in the end of it. And it fits in right over here on this side, right below the oil hole. So this hole right here is where you'd stick the oil in it and keep the screw lubed up, or at least the bearing up front there. And we've removed that set screw so that this retaining nut can come out. And it's a two-piece nut. It's got four notches cut in it, well, maybe two, and then the two spaces where the nut's been broken. Uh, and so just a little bit of light peening with a, with a punch here makes it turn, and we're trying to finish taking that out. Thought I'd get a shot of it before I did. All right. So you can see the break. And then one of the points where you can stick a punch in and work it on around. A bit of grease in here. Gunk. 70-some years of sitting in the shop. Um, and it's now freed up. Enough I can turn it by hand. But again, we've taken a punch, placed it in the grooves, uh, and then hammered away just a little bit, very gently. It turned really easily, but then last night I had also given it about 10 hours to soak a little WD-40, make sure everything was as loose as we could get it. So there's that retaining nut out. You can see it's a split design and the magnet doesn't want to let her go. They literally crack it so it's in two pieces and it can come off the end of the screw. And I set the screw down here. A box of dirty rags. It's in remarkably good shape for something that's been used this long. It's the inside and the ring would go right here, that retaining nut. And then there's the threading focus in um, wow it just doesn't even show signs of wear but that would have been the case with my grandpa he would have kept that thing lubed up like nobody's business there's the hole at the end with the threading and then of course the screw goes back up inside of that well there's the ram out the top of it had the corners rounded over just enough on the back that it would not come free I suppose my grandpa probably used it to bend sheet metal, etc., get a square bend on something he needed. And just back here where the paint is still showing, that uh, aluminum paint, there was just enough rounded over, it would not come out. And so I had to take the file and dress those corners up smooth. Uh, and she slid right on out. It is amazing the tolerances on these, the amount of detail that went into them. It's no wonder. They don't sell anything like this anymore. So there's the, the static jaw still in the base. We're going to try and pull that all apart. Um, and it's pretty gunky in here. There was never a want for lubrication from my grandpa. This nut is really interesting the way they make these. They're, they're in there with a dovetail in the metal underneath. And it slips back and forth. I've seen a lot of people have to take these apart and beat on that. But if you look at the amount of sludge and grease, uh, it never had a chance to freeze up. Most of them that I've seen, instead of having this little block, have a retaining pin that has to be beaten out from the bottom. I'm pretty sure there's a set screw buried under there and all that gunk that'll release that. Um, so at some point, they must have gone from the pin to this. The interesting thing is 
this vise has some slop when you open and shut it. And I think that's exactly because that, that mechanism is what's being used. So that amount of space right there, yeah, I don't know what that is, less than a quarter of an inch, uh, allows that nut to slide back and forth before you get positive engagement. A lot of gunk and oil in there. That nut has a positive stop at the front here. If you look, the cast won't allow it to slide any further forward. And so as a result, all the pressure when these two vice teeth come together, the jaws, is resting right down there. Well, a little bit of gentle persuasion, uh, overnight soaking with WD and a little bit of a ball peen hammer action there and gentle tapping. We've managed to get the handle off. Uh, this version only came with one. Most of them, it appears to me, have two. But we just have one on this side. Again, the old number 206R. Uh, the revised is what I have read the R stands for. Uh, after they changed the, the screw in them and maybe slightly the jaw design. So again, we'll see if we can pull this guy apart. So we got quite a bit of surface rust going on here, mostly from where it sat on a concrete floor for the last 15 years, drawing moisture. Well, there's the main nut out. I thought that might turn out to be quite a task, but it wasn't. That's a pretty big old huge slot across there. I just took a wonder bar, slipped the, the teeth into it, gave her a little turn and she came right out. Uh, we'd let it soak just a little bit. But I don't really think it needed it. The threads look fabulous, just the surface is rusted. Here's the base plate. You can see there's a, a bolt down in here. And it was rusted up to the top. I'd take a fall peen and give it a little tap to break it free. We're getting quite a bit of scale and rust up in here. But, uh, it appears that these bases really don't have anywhere for a person to oil them. And so no grease has been down in there for a very long time. Like I said, sitting on a floor, concrete drawing moisture. It's It's got quite a little scale rust going on on it. We'll get that cleaned up and get her treated. Oh, we got the base out here in the yard. There's the nut that holds the screw assembly. And there's the pin that holds the nut in place. I thought there'd be a screw inside of there, some sort of set screw. It turns out that's hollow. The hole goes all the way through. So here on the bottom, and you just have to drive the pin out. I did that just a second ago. It came out pretty easily. And you see it just pops on through. Well, once we got her sort of cleaned up, still a little crud in there. That's the reason we've had that slop. There's a set screw that's missing. It turns out it's the same size as the set screw in terms of diameter and thread count. This is what uh, Holds in the split nut, but it's going to need to be a little bit longer. We'll have to see if we can find us something. And sure enough, as soon as we cleaned up the back of this nut, you can see where the set screw was at one point in time. It's a little bite marks in there. And you'll have to get us another set screw. I'd like to talk about a couple of quick details and then thank you all. Um, number one, I did not show a lot of the painting process. I used a wire wheel for part of it, just a lot of elbow grease and cleaning up things, taped it all off and painted it. I used hammered paint uh, for both the body and the nut out there, the, the silver, hammered silver and hammered purple. Again, a little bit of the jewelry for the shop. I did not go ahead and fully polish out this portion, uh, nor did I really fully polish out the handle. I cleaned the rust off of it and I carnauba waxed the whole thing. I left the hammer marks and the ends right there and we'll talk about those in a minute. Uh, I did polish this up pretty well here and carnauba waxed it also. Uh, I used three bolts to bolt it down. There's one missing here and the reason is this bench was never designed to have a vise sitting on it like this. 
Ideally, you'd like to have the vise uh, projected out past the end of the bench so that any sort of object you clamped here could fall freely down and not hit the bench. And as you'll see, we're going to hit the bench. That said, it has a 10 inch jaw opening and it is not a big trick for me to stick a two by four chunk in behind it and I can clamp something down and have all the freedom I need to, to clamp and let something fall through. Um, the chisel marks are still in it from where it was cold chiseled on just a little bit. There are some file marks. Uh, something got into it pretty good right over here behind the welded jaw. You can see where there's a break between the softer cast and then the hardened jaw. Uh, there's a little bit of marking back here as well. You'll see a lot of these where people have pounded on this back anvil portion. I don't believe this was ever supposed to be pounded on. I think there are versions of these that have an anvil plate. I don't think this was ever intended for that. Uh, it was intended for general machinist work. I've read where a lot of the machinists were actually putting cast pieces into these in various shops and then chiseling, cold chiseling off the cast lines rather than grinding them. And I find that these are pretty rough surfaces on these guys. And if you'll see other videos, you'll see the same thing. Oftentimes people drill or pound on the backs of these, which damage them. And I've seen quite a few on that have a split back here. This one's never split, but you can see it's been beat on just a little bit. And as I showed you earlier, my grandpa clearly rounded things over these edges. And so that bound up the vise just a little bit, wouldn't let this come all the way out. I'm going to guess that in his mind, that was an advantage. So that nobody dropped this, I think it's probably about a 75 pound uh, jaw, maybe 65, off the end onto their foot. It was locked in there. Um, the handle, uh, well both handles, are still bent on these guys. And I'll, I'll link a couple of really cool little uh, shots out of a couple catalogs that I found online. Uh, if you're looking for more information, Garage Journal and, uh, what was the other one here? Toolarchives.com. Toolarchives.com has quite a few old catalogs and information. And uh, in, in Toolarchives.com, they have a catalog. Oh, actually, it's a, a, a little handbook by the Charles Parker Company, or Chaz Parker, as it's often on the side of their vices, about how to take care of your vice and use it properly. And one of the things they say is anytime you have to put a cheater pipe on any of the handles, what you're doing is extending beyond what the vise was designed for. If you can't get it tight enough with your bare hands, then you need a bigger vise. Um, and it's amazing what a bigger vise means. So often in new vices today, uh, for example, I have a little tiny one that has six inch jaws on it. It's so small compared to this. Uh, it isn't the jaw width so much as the weight. This 206 in the catalog comes in at 153 pounds. An eight inch, so a 208 comes in at 278 pounds, nearly 300 pounds, almost double the mass for two extra inches. And I'd really like to see one of the nine inches. Those come in at 327 pounds. This is just phenomenal amount of steel. This guy right here at 150 pounds, lifting it up as a single unit onto this bench, which is about four feet high, uh, is a pretty good hump for an individual. Not too bad if you take the two components apart and lift it up there, especially if you have the swivel base off of it, then it's very manageable. But 327 pounds for a nine inch would be just unbelievable in my opinion. So back to this. If this right here is not enough to get the compression you need, you need a bigger vise is the argument. Don't bend these things by putting cheater pipes on them. Uh, this one has been bent somewhere along the line. Somebody got really serious with it and there are quite a few hammer marks on it. Uh, the same is true of this. There's a slight bend in it. It works out ideally for me because I can turn it and it slopes it back in and it gives me more room in the garage. I have a, a Dodge Hemi, the extended cab, uh, quad cab, and it takes up a lot of space and it's kind of a scooch between the vise and this. So having that bent in there is handy. It doesn't catch on you. Uh, last thing. So like I said, those booklets I'll, I'll link to you and I'll show you a couple of pictures here in a minute. Last couple of things, um, position, lubed. So inside here with the screw, I went ahead and used a red sticky lube, uh, the, the bearing grease so that it would stay in place. Uh, I guess it was a stay lube here, premium red grease. Uh, I have some regular bearing grease. That stuff tends to, in the heat of the summer in here, oil up a little bit and drip, and I'm hoping that this will stay on there nice and tight. I did the same lubrication 
inside here. Uh, there is an oil hole, like I said, and the intention is for you to put oil in there. And I think eventually the oil works its way out, leaks out the front and keeps lubricating it. I didn't want oil dripping down and I'm not going to be using it every single day like somebody in a workshop would. I then watched several videos on people who, who tried all kinds of different lubricants for the actual ram, for the slides and, and down here in the bottom. And I would have just used a bearing grease. A lot of people use the red, uh, uh, just red grease, right? Stickier grease. Uh, or maybe an oil. But a couple of people had used the Johnson's Paste Wax, tested them, and it seemed to be that that was actually the best lubricant. Things slid back and forth really easily. And so I carnauba waxed the entirety of the vise, but on the ram, and then in the glides down below and inside here where everything touches, I went ahead and waxed that up with Johnson's Paste Wax. The stuff's inexpensive, and the vise glides really easily on it. On top of that, when my wife sticks her purse on this going in or out of this back door, she's not going to be unhappy with me because it's all covered in oil or grease. But that wax works really well lubricating it. Things spin up easy. Uh, the last thing I did is add some 7 8 inch O-rings. Uh, they were kind of a bite to get on in there. But you can see, and I doubled them up so they sit up out of there. As a little kid, my grandpa was always terrified we were going to smash a finger in there. Um, oh, and while I'm looking at this, see all the hammer marks? Uh, he always would hit this with a hammer, I'm pretty sure, to get it just that little bit tighter. Uh, in the manuals that I've read, they all say the same thing. You should never hammer on these. Uh, I've watched a couple of videos, and people will talk about how every time you hammer or you use a cheater pipe, what you do is you stretch the threads. I can see nowhere on those threads, and the jaws still close so tightly on this thing. Let's see if I can get it lined up so you're looking through there. As you bring it together, I mean, it would, it'll grab a hold of a business card easily. I think the company's figured this out. They did not want to be replacing jaws, etc. These are warranted originally for 10 years, I've read. So what they did do is make the handles out of steel that was soft enough that it would deform before you could break the jaws, before you could damage the the body of it before you could ruin the screw. The things that were expensive for them to manufacture and replace under warranty. I don't think it's an accident personally. If you know for a fact, let us know down below. All right, one last thing, and I will post it here in just a second. Uh, I was wrong about the date a little bit. I was guessing 1948-49, and, and that wasn't the case. And let me show you here. And then after that, like I said, uh, we'll show you a, a couple of images and post the links down below. Thanks again for watching. Hopefully I'll learn something from you guys as well. Bye-bye. If you look carefully, I think you can just make out that 951 even on the video here. They put a date stamp on the static jaw as well as the dynamic jaw. The dynamic jaw stamp was really faint. And even before I took the paint off, it, it was corroded free. You could just barely make out the 9 and the 5 and never really could see a 1. That said, I think those jaws are mated for each other. I think they were manufactured in the 7th month of 1951. And so again, that would make sense with the hockey puck, the hockey puck front on the end of it there. Uh, somewhere about 1950, they claim they started stamping them over on the right-hand side as well, but clearly this was on the left-hand side stamp. So if yours hasn't been wire-wheeled off, there's a good chance on your read you'll be able to find a date stamp as well. Mm -hmm.